Welcome to MovieTrack LTE B Plus Basic and Intermediate Training. This is Session 8. What we're going to look at in this session is very interesting and very important. We're going to talk about a tool that's built into the MovieTrack LTE B Plus. It allows you to solve many different problems, and it's called the Scope. The Scope is a very interesting tool. You can use it in many different ways. It has several purposes. So we're going to take a look at these and get you up to speed in this tool. So first of all, what is the scope for? Well, the scope is actually a multi-purpose tool. You can think of it sort of like a laboratory bench oscilloscope with multiple channels. If you've ever used an oscilloscope, you should be right at home with the scope. If you haven't, don't worry about it. I'm going to explain it pretty thoroughly before we're done. Let's talk about what you can do with it. It has four major purposes. First of all, it's often used just to confirm that everything's working with your VFD. If you want to confirm that your VFD is performing correctly, that it's ramping up and down in the right amounts of time, the scope is a wonderful tool for measuring that just to confirm that it's working. You can also use it for optimizing performance. If you have something that needs to be tweaked, the scope gives you a great visual way of doing that. You can also use it for diagnostics and troubleshooting. If you've got some kind of abnormal VFD behavior, you can use the scope to get a clearer picture of what's going on, and then hopefully you can correct the problem. And then finally, the scope is very good at dealing with troublesome faults. You can set the scope to watch different VFD parameters, and then when the fault occurs, you can go back, you can look at the trace, and hopefully that'll give you a clearer idea what really caused that fault. We'll explore several of these, and I'm going to demonstrate how to set up to do many of these as well. So let's overview the scope a little bit. We'll talk about its controls and the way it's set up. First of all, a few facts. The scope is actually built into the VFD. Now, obviously, you use LT Shell to display the data from it, but the scope hardware is inside the VFD, not the PC. And that's actually very important, as you'll see in just a minute. The scope does not actually require the PC to be present to do its job, and that's very important. The PC is only used for setting it up and also displaying the data. But the big idea here is you can configure the scope, close LT shell, disconnect and walk away, and the scope is still within the VFD doing its job. And when the right conditions come, it will collect data. You can then come back later plug back in, start up LT Shell, download the data, and look at it on your PC. As you can imagine, this is extremely helpful for diagnostics and fault tracing when the fault may only occur very rarely. A few additional things you need to understand about the scope. It's a four-channel scope. In other words, it can monitor four VFD parameters at once. You can see the channels here. They're currently all turned off. You do not have to use all four but you can use up to four at a time if you wish. Notice each one has a unique color. That color will match its trace on the scope display. Now, here's one thing that's very important to understand. Channels one and two can monitor quite a few different parameters. This is the complete list. You just click the little down arrow next to the channel, and then you can pick the parameter you wish it to monitor. Channels 1 and 2 are pretty thorough, but channels 3 and 4 are a little more restrictive. There aren't quite as many parameters available for those channels. So you may have to do a little juggling in order to monitor the parameters you're interested in all at once. And sometimes you won't be able to monitor everything you want in one go. For example, motor current, motor speed, and the DC bus voltage are only available on channels 1 and 2. That means you can't monitor all three of them at the same time. So do look at these lists and pick your channels and the parameters you're monitoring carefully. The scope has two different operating modes and they serve different purposes. The first is called continuous trace run. What this mode does is it just displays data continuously in real time. So you start the scope going, you'll see the trace appear on the screen immediately. You can play with the VFD and you can watch what it's doing on the screen. This mode is very handy when you're trying to just confirm that the VFD is doing what you expect or to tune or tweak the VFD in some way. So that's continuous trace mode. The other mode is called triggered capture mode. 
In this mode, you set up the scope and then it simply starts waiting for a particular event to occur, at which point it captures a snapshot around that event. And when you download it and see it on the screen, you can examine what happens surrounding that event. Triggered capture is very handy for dealing with faults. You can make the fault the event that the scope is waiting for, and then you can look at the data surrounding that fault. You can use it for other things too, but fault tracing is definitely one of the major applications of triggered capture mode. We'll play with both modes as we go along, but let's start by looking at continuous run mode. This is the easier of the two modes to set up and work with, so we'll talk about it first. This is good for monitoring the drive and confirming its desired behavior. And the way you set it up is very simple. You select continuous run under capture mode. You select the channels that you wish to monitor by assigning parameters to them. I've only picked two here, so only channels one and two are active. We're monitoring motor speed and RPM and motor current and amperes. Channels three and four are turned off. So you pick your channels and set up the parameters. Then you click the Start button, and immediately data will start appearing on the screen. When you've captured enough information, you can click the Stop button, and then you can manipulate what's on the screen and take some measurements from it. The first thing you'll probably want to do is position the traces vertically so that you can look at them properly. By default, they're all aligned on top of each other, but if you want to separate them and look at them independently, simply grab the little colored arrow next to each trace and move it up and down on the screen. This allows you to position everything. So I've moved my green trace, which is motor current, above my red trace, which is motor speed. At the bottom of the screen is a little window that shows all the captured data. Once the data is moved out of this window, it's gone forever, so you want to click the Stop button when you have what you need in the bottom window. But then by moving those vertical lines on the left and right side, you can zoom in the trace in the larger window above it. This is very handy for zooming into a detail that you want to look at more closely. There are two measurement cursors. They start on the right and left side of the screen. You just grab them and slide them. As they move over the trace, you will see the value of the traces appear in their channel windows. For example, right now I have grabbed the second cursor, the one on the right, and I've moved it. And it tells me that where it's located on the two traces, they're equal to 1796 RPM and 0.9 amps. So this allows you to take measurements on your traces. And you can use the two cursors together to take time measurements by positioning them at the beginning and end of an event. We'll look at this more in just a second. So you can do a lot with what's on the screen here, and it will tell you a great deal about your VFD. Now, when you're taking measurements, you're going to want to manipulate the traces and scale them. And you can do this better by expanding the channel box for each trace that you wish to work with. If you click the little blue up down arrow there, it opens and closes the channel controls. You can see I've expanded the motor speed channel and a bunch of hidden controls have appeared. For example, by clicking the scale up down buttons or typing a number into the box, I can vertically scale the trace to make it larger or smaller. If I click the Enable Auto Scaling button, it will scale the trace automatically and make it take up as much space as possible. And as I move my cursors, whichever cursor I've grabbed, its value will appear in the channel box. So right now, as you can see, I'm viewing both the red and the green traces where the rightmost cursor is positioned. If you position the left and right cursors at the beginning and end of an event, You'll notice there's a little symbol here, a triangle. That's a delta. The Greek letter delta it indicates the difference. And it's telling you the time difference between the two cursor positions. So notice I've positioned the left cursor at the bottom of the ramp, and I've positioned the right cursor at the top of it. The time difference is 4.67 seconds. So that tells me that this ramp took 4.67 seconds to execute. This can be very handy if you're trying to confirm you've got your ramp set correctly. All right, I think it's time to pause and do a demonstration of continuous run mode where we look at live data as it's coming back from the VFD through the scope. So let's do that. All right, well, I'm connected up to my MoviTrack LTE B Plus and I've scanned into it. 
we're right where we were in our last session. So we're going to just change a few parameters here, and then we're going to go ahead and exercise our scope in continuous run mode. First thing I'm going to do is turn on real-time edit. And I'm going to make a couple changes here. First, I'm going to my extended tab, and I'm going to change preset 1 to 1500 RPM. From our last activity, I'm in terminal control mode with variant 3. I'm going to actually keep that. Let's just review what variant 3 does. Digital input 1 is the stop run signal. Digital input 2 selects between the potentiometer and the preset speed, which we've just set to 1500 RPM. Digital input 3 is an external fault sensor, so we'll turn that switch on so it doesn't trip. And then the fourth input is the potentiometer. So that is perfect for what we're doing here. We're mostly going to use the preset speed, 1500 RPM. Let's go back to the basic tab. We're going to change our ramps. We're going to set our acceleration ramp to 8 seconds and our deceleration ramp to 3. Now, since we're ramping from 0 to 1500 and 1500 to 0, these times will be the actual time that it takes for these ramps to execute. All right, that's all we have to change, so let's turn off real-time edit and let's bring up the scope. We click the scope tab here. And what we need to do, first of all, is make sure we're in continuous run mode, which we are. That is our capture mode. And we need to pick our channels. I'm going to use just two channels here. I'm going to set channel one to monitor the motor's speed and RPM, and channel two is going to monitor the motor's current and amperes. And that is all we're going to look at. I'm going to turn digital input three on so we don't trip a fault. Then I'm going to turn digital input two on to select preset speed one. And then finally, I'll turn digital input one on to ramp up the drive to 1500 RPM. Once it's up to speed, I'll let it run for a few seconds, and then I'll bring it back down again. So here we go. Watch the screen. I'm going to click the Start button. The scope will start acquiring data. You can see there the trace is down at the bottom of the screen. It's just endlessly collecting data. All right, you can see we're ramping up. It's taking a while because we have a pretty slow ramp. And there we go, we're up to 1500 RPM. I'm going to turn the switch off. And I will click Stop to stop capturing data. If we look down at the bottom of the screen, this is the entire capture buffer, and you can see the data we're interested in is kind of in the middle of it. So first thing I'm going to do is just zoom in by moving these sliders here. And this restricts to what's being displayed on the larger screen above. So there, I've magnified the trace a little bit. I'm going to also separate the traces. They're sitting on top of each other. So I'm going to grab the green arrow here, click and drag it. And that'll move my motor current above my motor speed. I can also move my motor speed if I want. I'm going to open the channel. You can see we have the hidden controls here. I'm going to enable auto scaling on this one, so it's going to zoom up to the maximum. When you're taking measurements, it's often a good idea to magnify as much as you can. It makes taking more accurate measurements easier. Okay, so we can see our drive. We can see how it behaved, how it ramped up to speed. We also can see how the motor current changed as we were accelerating. Now, if we want to look at actual values, we can grab one of our cursors. We have a cursor here. We also have another one over here. It doesn't matter which one you use. I'll just take the one on the left side. And if I drag it right here, roughly in the middle, it's crossing the speed curve. And you can see the speed at that spot was 684 RPM. And where it crosses the current curve, you can see it was drawing 1.1 amps at that period of time. So this is useful if you want to look at the instantaneous values of the plot. Another thing that we often do in continuous run mode is we check ramps to make sure the drive is accelerating and decelerating as expected. So let's measure the up and the down ramps to see if they're actually 8 seconds and 3 seconds like we programmed them. Now what I'm going to do is zoom in on the up ramp a little bit by restricting what we see on the screen. So I'm going to zoom in here. And you can see this is our acceleration ramp. So what I'll do is I'll move my first cursor to the point where the speed just starts to change from zero and there changed to eight. So that's about where it starts. And I'm gonna take my second cursor 
And I'm going to move it to the point where the speed levels off at 1500 RPM, which is about here. And then I'm going to look over here at my delta, and you notice there's a time value, 8.2 seconds. So you can see, indeed, our acceleration ramp is just about right. We programmed it to 8 seconds, and it took about 8 seconds. Let's check our down ramp. We need to alter our zoom here to look at the other ramp. And again, we move the cursor to just the point where the speed starts to fall, about there. And the point where the speed levels off at zero, right about here. And you can see the delta is 3.13 seconds. So again, it's almost spot on. We programmed it to three seconds, and it appears we did achieve that. Okay, well, I hope you found that interesting and already are seeing places you can use the scope in your day to day work. We're now going to look at the second and slightly more sophisticated mode, triggered capture mode. This mode requires a lot more explanation to really use it correctly. I'm going to give you some fairly technical details about what's going on inside the scope, so listen closely. I think you'll find, though, that once you understand this, it really unlocks the door to do a lot of useful things using this tool. Let's talk about triggered capture a little bit. First of all, the big idea, when you're in this mode, the scope is waiting for the trigger. That is a specific event. It could be a fault occurring, could be any fault or a specific fault. It could be a parameter changing to some value, or it could be one of the digital inputs rising or falling, generating an edge. Whatever the trigger is, the scope is watching for it. And of course, you pick what you want the trigger to be. Now, when that trigger occurs, something very important happens. The scope acquires a snapshot of the channel data from whatever channels you've selected for the periods before, during, and after the trigger. So what you're really getting is a picture of all the events surrounding the trigger. And by looking at that, you can see what happened in the time leading up to the trigger, what happened at the trigger, and what happened right after it. And that hopefully will help you solve whatever problem it is you're trying to crack. Now, some very important concepts and terms that I want to introduce. The first one is pre-trigger data. What is pre-trigger data? It's the percentage of the total data in the snapshot from the time before the trigger event. So this is information from the channels before the trigger happened. Then there is post-trigger data. This is the percentage of data in the total snapshot from after the trigger event. So after the trigger occurs, everything after that time is post-trigger data. So pre-trigger data and post-trigger data surround the trigger event. Now you set the pre and post-trigger values by setting the pre-trigger percentage only. The post-trigger percentage is whatever's left. So if you set the pre-trigger to 10%, the post-trigger is going to be automatically 90% because pre and post-trigger have to add up to 100%. Okay, hopefully that made sense. But if not, hang in there. We're going to talk about this in much more detail. Let's talk about how triggered capture works. Think of the capture hardware in the scope like a camera. And that camera is taking pictures of up to four parameters at a time. So you can select four channels, four parameters. In this case, maybe motor speed, motor current, DC bus ripple, and the speed reference. And what the capture hardware does is it takes pictures of these parameters at regular intervals and stores them in a memory buffer within the MobiTrack LTE B+. This is all inside the VFD. It's not on the PC. So there are four channels of scope memory. And the memory is not very big. It's very important to realize it's very limited. So it can fill up very quickly. And so when you set up the capture hardware, you're going to have to think about the size of your memory when you do that. Now what the scope does while it's waiting for the trigger is it's taking snapshots of each monitored parameter and it's doing this at regular intervals and storing the values in its memory. So sort of like this, this is what's happening in the background. The scope is taking snapshots, it's monitoring those parameters, turning them into numbers, and dumping the numbers into the four memories associated with the channels, okay? Now, there is something that you set in the scope called the sample rate, and that determines how often the scope takes snapshots. 
You can set it up so it's taking snapshots very rapidly, maybe a snapshot every 10 one thousandths of a second, every 10 milliseconds. Or you could set it really slow. Maybe it's just taking a few samples per second. It's up to you. And the sample rate is going to be largely determined by what you're looking for. Now, here's a very big idea. The faster the sample rate, the better the quality of the trace of the data you're collecting, but also the faster the scope fills its memory. Once the memory's full, you're done. So a very fast sample rate will fill up the memory very quickly, but give you a very high quality trace. A slower sample rate will stretch out the memory longer, but the trace will be poorer. So picking the sample rate is something of an art, and you have to often compromise between quality and how long you can capture data. Now here's another important idea to understand. When it's idle, Waiting for the trigger, the scope is endlessly filling its channel memory using a technique called circular buffering. In other words, what it's doing is it's filling the memory and then going back to the beginning and overriding the oldest data first in an endless circle. It looks like this. Notice it's collecting data, it's filling memory up, and then it goes back to the beginning and fills up the oldest data first, and then the newest, and then it goes back around again. And you see it's just endlessly going in a circle. So this circling will continue until the trigger happens. And the scope just does this in the background. And of course it does it with all four channels. I'm just showing one channel here. So the scope is watching for the trigger while endlessly filling its memory at the sample rate you've selected. Now when the trigger occurs, the scope changes its behavior. It continues collecting snapshots until it reaches the place in memory where the pre-trigger percentage is located at which point it stops. Let me illustrate this. I think this will make more sense as you see it in the animation. Let's say we've set our pre-trigger percentage to 20% and our post-trigger is automatically therefore 80%. They add up to 100, remember. The scope is going to preserve 20% of the data in the buffer before the trigger and 80% afterwards. So here we go. It's just collecting data circularly, buffering, going round and round, waiting for the trigger, and then suddenly, boom, the trigger happened right here. As soon as that happens, the scope says, okay, I'm gonna keep collecting data until I reach that 20% in the circular buffer from before the trigger, at which point I'll stop so I don't overwrite it. So this is the data that it wants to keep. It's going to keep collecting and buffering round and round until it gets here and then it stops. So we have a trace with the pre-trigger data preserved, the trigger itself, and then the post-trigger data until the memory buffer is full. Now, when you read this back in LT shell, the scope automatically organizes the data in the correct sequence like this. And this will be used to construct the trace, which then appears on the screen. So you have the data before the trigger that you asked for and the data after the trigger. And then when you download this into LT shell, it turns it into a visual trace on the screen. The trace on the screen identifies where the trigger is with a little white arrow. And you can see here that it's mostly pre-trigger data. We kept very little post-trigger since the arrow is sort of on the right side of the screen. So this is information that was collected before the trigger, and this is information after. When you're tracing faults, you often do that. You're mostly interested in what happens before, not after the fault. But you can, of course, adjust this to whatever you want. All right, I hope that's making sense. Let's talk about how you set up triggered capture. It takes a fair amount of setup. You have to select the trigger itself and then configure the capture parameters. So you do this in the lower right side of the screen. The first thing you do is you have to pick trigger on event mode. So make sure you're not in continuous run mode. Then you have to pick the trigger type and there are several types. A trip, that's a fault, so you can trigger on a fault. You can trigger on a specific level on the parameter being monitored by channel one, and you can trigger on the digital inputs whether they have a rising or falling digital signal. Three possible triggers. Now, the configuration box, some of these options will gray out when you pick these. I've enabled them all here so you can see them all at once, but some of these will gray out or disappear depending on the trigger type you pick. Let's sort of work our way through these. Let's say you decide you want to trigger on a trip, a fault in other words, 
you would then have to pick which fault you want it to trigger on. You can trigger on any fault, so if any fault at all occurs, you can trigger or you can pick a specific one. On the other hand, if you're interested in triggering on one of the digital inputs, then you'll have to pick either the rising or falling edge to trigger on. And if you do the level of channel one, whatever that parameter is, you have to adjust the level using the up and down buttons or typing a number into the box. That would mean you would watch a parameter and when it rises or falls above a certain level, then it would trigger. Now, once you've done that, you set the sample rate with the pull down box. Notice here it's set to five milliseconds. That means every five one thousandths of a second, it will capture a sample. That's a fast sample rate, but you can set it much slower. Notice right below it is the total capture time, two and a half seconds, which isn't very much. If that's too short, you'll need to pick a longer sample rate. What you'll often have to do is sort of juggle between the quality given by a quick sample rate and the long time by a slow sample rate. And then finally, you set the pre-trigger percentage here. And of course, the post-trigger percentage is 100% minus this value. Notice it's set to 10% here. That means post-trigger is automatically 90%. So that's all the setup. And then finally, what you do is you click the Start button, and the scope will start waiting for the trigger. Sort of like cocking a gun. Once it's cocked, it's ready to fire when you pull the trigger. That's the idea. So the scope will go into wait mode at that point. Now, setting the pre and post trigger percentages can be rather tricky. People, when they're beginning with this, often wonder, what do I set it to? The answer is there is no perfect setting. You need to set it to emphasize what you're looking for with your application. You need to emphasize what you're interested in in the data. So for example, if you set the pre-trigger percentage to 90%, it means 90% of the data captured will happen before the trigger and 10% after. This emphasizes what leads up to the trigger event. For example, this is often good for tracking faults because you're interested what happened right before the fault, what caused the fault. And then afterwards, you probably don't care too much about it. Maybe you want to see how the VFD handled shutting down when the fault happened. So you do collect a little data, but you want to put most of it as the pre-trigger percentage. On the other hand, you could do exactly the opposite in other situations. You set pre-trigger to 10%, which means most of the data is going to be post-trigger, 90% of it. This emphasizes what happens after the trigger event. Maybe if you're watching a digital input, you would set it up this way. And when the digital input rises or falls, you would start collecting data. And therefore, you want information mostly after that event. Or you could set it in the middle. You could set it to 50%. And then you'll get equal amounts of data showing what surrounds the trigger on both sides. It just depends on your application what you do. OK, so I think it's time for another demonstration. Let's do a number of triggered captures and see how they differ and how they're similar. All right, we're going to experiment with triggered capture mode. We're going to actually do three different kinds of triggered capture, so you get exposed to all of them. You can see we're back in the scope here. We haven't changed any parameters on the VFD. They're set to just what they were before but we do need to go ahead and set up our scope. Now, the first thing we need to do is change it to trigger on event mode, and we need to pick some channels. Let's go ahead and use motor speed again for our first value, but we'll use the DC link voltage for our second value. All right, so that's what we're going to capture. Now, for our first demonstration, we're going to capture around a fault event. So we go down to trigger event and we make sure it's set to trip. Then we pick trip type and we change it from any trip to external trip. As you recall, we're in terminal control mode variant three, which monitors an external sensor on digital input three. So we'll be able to generate a trigger just by flipping the switch attached to that input. All right, now we need to do two other things. We need to set our sample rate. Right now it's set to five milliseconds. So every five one thousandths of a second, it's going to take a snapshot of these channels. Now our total capture period is only two and a half seconds, which isn't very long. So we're going to have to slow the sample rate down, which will degrade the trace quality, but give us more time. I'm going to switch to 20 milliseconds, which gives us a 10 second trace period. 
Now, when you're dealing with fault monitoring, you generally are interested in what comes before the fault, not after it. So we're going to set our pre-trigger percentage fairly high. It's set to 90 right now. I'm going to up it even further to 95%. What that means when the trigger occurs, 95% of our data is going to be from before the trigger and 5% after. So we will see the VFD shut down, but that's about all after that. All right, we're ready to go. So I'm going to click the Start button. Before I do that, however, I'm going to make sure that Digital Input 3 is turned on so the VFD won't trigger the instant I enable it. And I've just confirmed that that's OK. So I'm going to click Start. And you can see now it's just sitting here saying waiting for a trigger. It will do this if necessary for days. However, we won't make it wait that long. We'll go ahead and start up the VFD. I'm going to turn Digital Input 2 on, which will select our preset speed, 1500 RPM. And then I'm going to turn digital input one on and let the VFD ramp up. Here we go. All right, we're accelerating, coming up to speed. And now we're up to speed. I'm going to trip a fault by turning DI3 off. Notice that the scope display immediately told me that it received a trigger. Notice it's transferring the data from the scope memory into LT shell so we can work with it. While it's doing that, I'm going to clear my fault. All right, so we can see we have our two traces here. The red trace is the motor speed and the green trace is the DC bus voltage. I'm going to move the DC bus voltage up out of the way. I'm also going to move my motor speed trace up a little bit. So there we go. Now, notice our white arrow here, that shows where the trigger occurred. So the trigger occurred right out here at this position. Everything before that is data that occurred before the trigger. So we can see exactly what happened. The motor was accelerating. It came up to speed. It ran at a steady speed for a while. Then I tripped the fault and immediately it shut down. And we see a small amount of data right after it showing the shutdown period. So this is a method you can use when you're trying to track down the cause of a fault. You pick parameters that you think will reveal the cause of the fault, and then you set up the trigger so that it looks for the fault you're interested in. And when it happens, you download the data and you can take a look. All right, so that's trigger on a fault. Let's change to another type of event. Let's change it from trip to digital input two. So we're going to use digital input two, which happens to select between the potentiometer and the preset. What I'm going to do is turn digital input two off right now, which selects my potentiometer for speed control. Now, what I'm going to do is make a rising edge on that input. In other words, switching to the preset speed, my trigger event. So I make sure trigger slope is set to rising edge. It is. I'm going to leave my sample rate at 20 milliseconds. We need to think about our pre and post trigger settings. In this particular case, I'm going to set it to 50. I'm actually going to just type a number directly in here. What will happen when I switch from potentiometer control mode to preset mode, the VFD will trigger and the scope will collect data around that event. Half the data will be from before it, half will be from after it. Okay, so I'm going to start my scope. And it warns me that I'm about to overwrite the older trace, and I'm fine with that, so I'll say OK. And it's now waiting for a trigger. I'll start up the VFD, I'll run it in potentiometer mode for a while, ramp the speed up and down a few times, and then I'll switch to preset. And you'll notice as soon as I do that, we'll trigger, and we'll collect some data, and then eventually it will appear on the screen. So here we go. All right, so I'm ramping up and ramping down, and I'm just turning my knob up and down a few times, generating some data. And now I'm going to switch to preset by turning DI2 on, and you'll see that immediately triggers. We're accelerating up to 1500 RPM. We're still collecting data, and there we go. We're done. We filled our buffer, and now we're transferring it to LT shell. I'm going to shut off my drive. 
And there we go. You can see where I was ramping it up and down. You can see that the trigger event's right in the middle. And this is the point we switched up to the preset speed right here. And we can confirm that because if we move the cursor, we see that that's 1500 RPM. So that is triggering on a digital input. We're going to do just one more and then we're done. We're going to change to trigger on a level using the parameter in channel one, which is motor speed. Now, what we have to do here is pick where it's going to trigger. We need to set a trigger level. Right now it's set to zero RPM. I'm going to set it so that when the speed reaches 500 RPM, it will trigger the scope. And I'm going to change my pre-trigger to 50% again. So we're going to collect equal amounts of data around the trigger. Okay, I've clicked start to prime the trigger. So we're now waiting. I'm going to start my VFD. I'm going to turn the potentiometer knob back and forth a few times and then I'm going to allow it to go over 500 RPM and trigger. Here we go. All right, I'm turning it up and down, but I'm being careful not to go over 500 RPM, and now I'm gonna turn it all the way up. And there we go, we just triggered it. We're now still collecting some data, and now we're transferring it to LT Shell. I'll go ahead and turn off the VFD while we're waiting for it to transfer. And there we go. And you notice if we move one of the cursors here, the point where it triggers was right at 500 RPM. So there we go. I've shown you all three ways of triggering the scope in LT Shell. There are lots of uses for this, and I leave it up to you to discover other ones. All right, we're almost done, but there are two miscellaneous topics that I'd like to talk about before we wind up. These also pertain to specific things you can do with the scope. First of all, let's talk about using the scope to collect data later. Let's say that you have a fault that happens once every three days or so. Obviously, you want to use the scope to chase it down, but equally obviously, you cannot leave your PC plugged into it for three days. Well, happily, you don't have to, because the scope is built into the VFD, not the PC. All you have to do is configure it with the PC, and then once you've done that, you can walk away. So once you've configured the scope and clicked the start button so it's waiting for the trigger, you can close the LT shell program, disconnect your PC and walk away. The scope is just going to sit there for days if necessary until the trigger occurs. Now once the trigger occurs, it will capture the snapshot and hold it in memory. And then you can come back once that fault has occurred or whatever it was you're watching for, and then you can plug your PC back in and collect the data. So what will happen when you plug in your PC and you scan in, if you go to parameter tab 00, the read only parameters and look at parameter P0-20, you notice there's a value there. It says scope capture data available. Yes, that means there's a trace in memory and you can download it. And so if you go into the scope screen and you click that button in the upper right corner, it will download the trace and you'll be able to see it on the screen, use the cursors to take measurements, whatever. Now, a little warning here, don't turn off the VFD. If you power off the VFD after it's collected a scope trace, the scope trace will be lost. So the scope trace is not permanently held in memory. It's only held there as long as the VFD is powered up. So if the VFD faults and you've collected a trace, Plug in your laptop, download the trace first before turning off the VFD. All right, you've been warned. And that leads to another topic, saving and loading traces. You can save a scope trace. Now you may wonder why would I wanna do that? Well, let's say you've got a really stubborn problem that you just cannot solve. Maybe you call up your local regional engineering group and you ask them to help you out. They may ask you to capture and email them a scope trace. So you can save scope traces and you can email them to a support engineer for analysis and that person can then open them up, examine them, and maybe give you some thoughts on how to solve your problem. So how do you save a scope trace? It's really easy. Once you've captured one, you go up to the toolbar and you click the little floppy disk icon and that will save the trace. 
If you want to look at a save trace, you can click the button right next to it, the little open folder, and that will open up the trace and you can look at it on your screen. When you save traces, by default, they have these really long file names. Now you may wonder, why is that so huge? Well, notice what it does. It stores a lot of information about the VFD right in the file name. It tells you it's a MovieTrack LTE B+. It tells you the voltage. It tells you its horsepower rating, its firmware version, the address it's set to. So there's a lot of info buried in that file name. Now, if you don't want to use a really long file name, you can change it. This is just the default, but this is how they look. Okay, so do remember that. Keep it in your bag of tricks. You may have to capture a trace, save it, and send it to someone. And we are now done with session eight. In session nine, we're going to talk about field bus communications with the MobiTrack LTE B+. So see you next time.